It's Christmas everyone! This was the original intro for this video by the way. So I've gone a bit over the top with the theming, but I mean who's surprised? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry you had to do that. Hey guys, it's model making time and we're back. Today we are building the CT114 Tutor from Canada, which was a Canadian jet trainer built in the 1960s. I've been really excited to do this one and I thought, hey, Canada is cold and the team's called the Snowbirds. It's almost like it's Christmas. Yeah, I know, I'm not original at all. I know everyone has done this before, but I'm going to do that too. <laughs> so we're going to build the Snowbirds version of the CT114, which I'm really excited to do. The Snowbirds are a display team that I've wanted to see for a very long time, but they've never really gone international. In fact, they actually use an aircraft that's no longer used by the Canadian Armed Service. Or Canadian Air Force, I should probably say. <laughs> this aircraft is actually pretty much only used by their display team at this point. It's a really interesting aircraft, and if you want to find out more information about the aircraft, or really any Canadian aircraft, I recommend you check out Polyus Studios. They're one of my favourite YouTube channels. They make absolutely incredible documentary style videos about Canadian aircraft and the Canadian industry. It's fascinating, honestly. So check them out after this video, the link is in the description. At the end of the 1950s and throughout the 1960s onwards, aircraft industries were developing in pretty much every country. Everyone wanted to make the next successful jet or fighter or trainer aircraft and Canada was no different. I guess this is sort of like the Canadian equivalent of the Project Provost, if it makes it easier for people to understand. It's a side-by-side -side trainer that was designed, you know, to lead you into jet aircraft. The Canadian example, however, differed by having a T-tails, so the control surfaces for the tail were at the top, forming a T-shape, rather than traditionally where they are at the bottom. It gives the aircraft a really distinct, unique profile. The Canadian air industry has been controversial to say the least. People tend to draw parallels between the Canadian air industry and the British air industry, particularly with how their governments responded in the face of American pressure to buy American products, or that's how the story goes. We're not going to delve too much into this, but Canada produced some really interesting aircraft. This included the CF-100 Canuck, but also the CT-114 Tutor that we're going to look at today. The Snowbirds were reactivated or reformed, however you want to describe it, on the 1st of April 1978. Since then, they've probably been the most iconic element of the Canadian Air Force, or I guess potentially even the Canadian Armed Forces. Being super visible and touring North America, they've become an icon of Canada and Canadian aviation. This has not been without its controversies. There have been several incidents for the aircraft, and some within fairly recent years, which have highlighted its age. So far this hasn't resulted in the aircraft being permanently grounded, but there have been calls for it. People have said that the aircraft is too old and out of date and really shouldn't be performing the maneuvers that it's doing. People are concerned about the age of the airframes and I mean, that's understandable. I just hope that they get to tour Europe one time before they do go because I've never seen them and I'd absolutely love to hear the sound of a tutor flying in front of me or a formation of them. The aircraft was retired by the Canadian Air Force in the year 2000. They were the last military operator of the aircraft, with 212 examples being built. There was one export customer, which I think people find quite bizarre to think about because it's not really spoken about, but Malaysia actually bought some and retired them in 1985, so they did actually survive quite a long time, having entered service in 1967. There was even a four-seat passenger variant suggested, so this aircraft could have had a long feature, but unfortunately it just wasn't on the table. Let's have a look at this kit. It's made by Hobbycraft Canada, or a lot of people tend to call them Hobbycraft Canada. Mm, yeah, that's that's the quality of their kits, guys. I've only ever built one of these before, and that was an Avro Canada Arrow. I never filmed that, that was way long ago. Um, if you want to see that, that's in the description below. I built one as if it was in modern livery. Um, so yeah, let's go and have a look what's inside this Christmassy box. <laughs> Boom, I'm so excited to do this kit. It's looking, ah, look at the artwork, it's so adorable. I, I, I really, really love this aircraft. Like, it's so hard to explain how much I just adore the CC114. Like, <sighs> Yeah, um, I've had a few boxings of this. Like many kits, I lost them in the past and I'm really, really excited to build this. So let's have a look what's inside. Okay, before we look at any sort of plastic, let's have a look at what we get included. So uh, get a catalogue. Demandez votre catalogue d'aujourd'hui. 
<laughs> we take an active interest in your ideas and thoughts. <laughs> Send them what you want. <laughs> oh, decals. Okay. Mm. I'm not. I'm not. I've not got a lot of faith in these. I'm gonna be really honest. No. Okay. So I've had to turn on a bright light, but those bits here are these bits where it says Canada. The snowbirds here have a white outline. That is this bit here, which looks like how it's meant to be. So that's fair enough. There's a big white bit here, which I don't know if you can see too well, but that's sort of the underside, this bit here, or this bit here, I guess. So <sighs> they look kind of shit, I'll be really honest, <laughs> but they're not the worst, I guess. Instruction wise, cockpit, pretty basic, but I mean, I can probably do some dry brushing, make it look okay. Um, the assembly is fine. I'll probably put some weight in the nose though to make sure that it does sit properly. Otherwise it looks pretty easy, I'm gonna be really honest. Yeah, so this is the bit we're all dying for, right? Like how these bits look and feel. So let's have a look at the fuselage. Uh, there are some recessed detailing, it's, it's limited. There is not a lot, like anywhere. <laughs> There's not a lot. Wings preformed, I like that. And then I have to stick them together, which is normally the first thing I do anyway. Is that the instrument panel? Here it is. So yeah, you can see it's got some detail on it. It's not got a lot of detail to it. Just trying to see if you can see it in the light, but yeah. It's got some detail on it, it's not a lot. It will look fine, probably. It's, it's 172 seconds, we all know I don't really care about cockpits. But I mean, overall, this, this is literally it. That is the whole kit, so it's not gonna be very hard. And my camera's not gonna focus. <laughs> So now for the clear parts. So, I mean, how, I mean, first of all, let, let's see how, how well you think it looks. So do you think this looks good, guys? Do you think these look really good clear parts? Um, spoiler, that they're not, <laughs> they're not great. Yeah, these are kind of pretty average, if I'm really honest. Um, there's even like a weird plastic hair. Gross. There's like a, an effect when you're looking through it. It doesn't look like you're looking through glass. It looks like you're looking into one of those like crazy mirrors. Um, so yeah, it's definitely not the clearest plastic in the world. I'll give it a four out of 10. It's below average, but it's perfectly surfaceable. So now that I've seen inside the box, I know that the biggest issue is gonna be the paint job. I mean, I have to make sure that I line it up all properly. We've had some practice lining up two distinct colors on an aircraft before. When we did the French display team, La Peinture de France. So I think I can do this and not mess it up, but there's nothing more I can do than get into it because well, as we learned last month, I'm not letting hold me back. So let's go. Welcome to my first live stream on YouTube. Yes, this is the first one that I actually did over here on YouTube. I tend to stream on Sundays at 4.30 and if you are subscribed to the channel, which you should definitely do so if you haven't done already, um, you'll get a notification or a, a, a sort of pile in your subscription feed letting you know that hey you can set a reminder for this live so please do so i love seeing you guys in the live streams and uh you might get to take part in choosing what i'm doing in the future too so that'll be interesting uh either way this is a really simple kit and i started off by dry fitting everything as you can see at the top um i just dry fitted everything together and then i built the cockpit the cockpit is quite simple um and I, that's not a negative like cockpits can be quite simple and effective the way to do that is to layer out your colours and do some dry brushing and just, you know, add some realism to them. And let's be honest, cockpits in, you know, most fighter jets are very monotone. They're not there to be colourful, they're to be functional. And, you know, you actually don't want to reflect a lot of light around, which tends to mean there's a lot of black, a lot of grey, a lot of brown, so they're not necessarily that interesting. In fact, I'd argue that World War II cockpits are more interesting than, you know, modern day cockpits, so I wasn't too fussed about it not being like super interesting. So yeah, it was, it was quite straightforward. The rest of the construction wasn't that bad either, really. Again, it was a very simple design overall. I stuck the little, I think they're smoke pods rather than fuel tanks, aren't they? Um, the, the, for, for the underneath of the aircraft, for the smoke system. I set them together ready for later. I don't think I ever actually filmed me make putting them on the model <laughs> or um or even like painting them but i did remember them well after i finished most of the model i undercoated the uh, cockpit itself just in a simple gray um and that is a uh, tamiya no actually sorry i used humbrol's uh, basic primer number one and it works pretty well 
Uh, it, it gives a really nice grey finish. It's quite a standard grey anyway that's used in a lot of model kits. So, you know, quite often I've used it and then gone, oh, I don't need to paint over this. So, yeah, it's quite good to be, to be honest. I did use some reference photos on Google to try and make sure I got the cockpit somewhat accurate. Um, hence why you can see me painting the red on there. Again, it's just from what I could see online, that's what it should be. Um, it was mainly a lot of greys from what I could see. So again, I was just trying to get somewhat accurate, probably slightly oversaturated colors, you know, can bring some vibrancy when you have the canopy on there. Bearing in mind, again, that this isn't the best canopy in the world either. So it's, it's not gonna show a lot through it to be perfectly honest with you. So I was adding some weight into the front of it, I think. That's why you can see the modeling putty there. I don't know if you uh, could actually see that, but yeah, that was just adding some weight into the front as well. Um, that's something I do in most model kits and modeling putty is great for that, along with filling in any little gaps that you might find um, during the course of putting the model together as well. So you can see I'm actually assembling the model here. Oh, I was wrong. No, I didn't. I think I just put modeling putty in the front, maybe. Either way, assembly, that's it. Pretty much for the entire kit. <laughs> that's it that's the whole construction done it is mind-blowing how simple this kit is and i had a lot of fun i was very careful obviously the whole time because i wanted to make sure that it worked this is a really really expensive kit but i think the result i got in the end was pretty spot on maybe <laughs> i don't know but you know, we'll see how we get with the end result, won't we? <laughs> um, yeah, taped it together, make sure it all held together really nicely whilst it was gluing in place. <laughs> hey guys, so we're on stream two of the CT114 Cheetah, the Snowbirds aircraft. You can see that I've uh, got it all undercoated in white. Uh, it may look a bit grey, but it is white, trust me. And yeah, we're going to get on and build it. So we're onto the painting of the model kits, and yeah, so you can see I've undercoated it in white. This was, is it Corax white or something from um, Warhammer's sort of color range? Um, purely because I can get that from a local store really easily, just the walk down from my house. Um, so I use that quite a lot. Plus it really helps with the vibrancy as a lot of people pointed out when I was doing uh, La Partie du France, uh, trying to get the uh, Tricolor on the uh, on the wings. I was pan painted the white, and that wasn't the way to go. So besties, I did it. I, I actually improved on something. Now I was masking out where I wanted everything to go. The aircraft is split into three different color sections: red, blue, and white. And yeah, it, it worried me mainly because it's white. So on uh, Partout de France, um, or even Fletcher Tricolori, it's blue on top and then either red on the bottom in the case of uh, Hans or it, it's aluminium on the bottom in the case of Tricolori. So if you go over one way or the other, you can really easily fix it. With this, as it's white, it's a pain in the... Mm, yeah, to, uh, to, to, to repaint it over. So I was really careful to try and make sure I got something somewhat accurate and that I wasn't going to have to paint over a lot because that was an absolute nightmare of an idea to me. Um, spoiler, it went okay in the end. I, I didn't struggle too badly. So a lot of the things we learned doing uh, La Partie de France brought over to this kit and worked pretty damn well. And it made me realize how important masking is and how masking is like actually a lifesaver and a skill that's really important to learn when you're doing model kits. And even if you're just doing it to make some like silly camo or just to practice, do it. Like if you're new to modeling, get some masking tape. I think you can get like Ravel masking tape for like three pounds or three euros on Amazon right now. Like, and that's with prime delivery and it's it's perfectly fine. You'll see a lot of Tamiya tape around, but it, it's, you know, it works the same. None of them leave any residue, at least in my experience. Now, I was going through to do some touch up because I did get some spillover on the red. I didn't do all of the bottom straight away because I was just making sure I got the top done. Um, I was touching it up with white. I was using Rebel Aqua Color for the white that I was touching it up with. It wasn't quite the same, so I made sure it blended in as much as I possibly could in the end. And yeah, I was pretty happy with what I got, to be perfectly honest. With the red, I did what I normally do because it's a gloss, do thin layers and just keep going over and over and over and it'll take you probably a millennium but you'll eventually get a solid block colour that doesn't look too brushy because when it looks like when you start off it will look really really brushy. 
Um, you can see I'm going over with the white now just to make blend everything in and make it all look unified. So yay, we did it. <laughs> Hey, editing me. I completely forgot to film anything for this, but hey, so this happened not long after the actual stream itself, but there was, um, you're going to see some complications in this one, and I genuinely ended up crying when I finished this, so yeah, something, something happens. There may have been a bit of forewarning in the previous comments that I made about the decals. Not the worst of us. Who knows if they were accurate or not? Who knows? <laughs> so yeah, let's go into the decals and pretty much finishing off the uh, the, the model kit. <laughs> right, so straight off the bat, I just want to let you know that I did forget to film me putting on a lot of the decals, but you'll see why I got very stressed doing this. So I'm starting with the bottom because I thought, hey, I'll get the bottom done. That's the most important and intricate part. Um, and the bit I'm most worried about. So you can see I've cut it out there. I've tried to make it as accurate as possible. Mm, nope, it's starting to rip. And yeah, now it's getting worse. And basically, it just wouldn't come off the decal sheet at all. And when I did get it off, it didn't look great. And it was tearing and folding, and it wasn't even really that opaque. And I didn't really know what to do. And I took a little break and panicked. And this wasn't on stream, luckily, so I could do that. And yeah, I decided, hey, I'm not gonna give up because normally I would cry and give up and I have done on the Red Arrows before. No, I was gonna power on through and mask it all up and use my judgment to try and work out where things were. Luckily, this is quite an angular design, so it's quite easy to mask up. Just gotta use your judgment to, you know, make it as accurate as possible. Did we get something 100% accurate? No, you can probably, some of you who are eagle-eyed can probably tell that it's not perfectly level but I'm still really happy with what we get in the end. But there was a lot of emotion put into this because it is expensive and that was the primary driving force for me. This is an expensive kit. I couldn't afford to just start again. I couldn't afford to get a replacement. Like I wouldn't be able to from <laughs> probably like a year at this point. So yeah, I, I decided to go for it. You can see that I'm using a gray paint and actually what I'm using is um, some primer from, I'm spraying into the cup of the primer and, um, spray that I have because I don't have another primer on hand and just using that to get a base down on top of the gloss because I've already varnished this bear in mind to put the decals on so then I went on with white and we decided layering and layering and layering and trying to make sure that we could get something that would work and well I mean you, you tell me did I do it? <laughs> hey so here's the situation I've nearly cried because of this but it doesn't look the worst. I'm just very angry right now because the decals are completely fucked and that means I'm gonna have to do everything by hand. Um, I'm gonna have to scrape off a lot of paint, which is, it is what it is. Like, it's fine, I'll, I'll rescue it. Um, I mean, after that CT7 video, I'm not as scared of these things. And to be honest, I think for the most part, if I just sort of like smooth it out, it shouldn't actually be that bad because I'm, I'm painting red over it really, aren't I? So it, it will be fine. I just need to be really, really careful doing it. Um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be honest, like I was very close to giving up on this model and now I'm very much back in it. <laughs> so see, I'm, I, I don't, I, I'm too stressed to film it. So I'm just gonna go in with my red and we're just gonna see, see how we go. I'll be back in a bit. So all you're gonna see now is the tidying up process. And this was just to show, hey, you, you can do this. Using the hairdryer was something that I heard someone do. I think a model show I overheard someone use it. And it really worked. It got really flat fine layers that are really even the paint distributed out really nicely and it got me a really sharp image and although i got some bleed that went away so like you could feel it with the paint pressure you could feel the layers made it a lot easier as i said though i did forget to do the rest of the decals so you're only going to see me paint the bottom and then through the power of editing you're going to see a complete model in a second so yeah. <laughs> I'm actually 
<laughs> I'm actually at the point where I'm really crying. Like, look at it. I saved it. So all of this hand painted at the bottom. All of that is hand painted, masked off. Use the hairdryer to keep drying it to get really nice standard layers. And it looks, it's wonky, but we're going with it. And then I used a matte varnish and all the other decals. And I've had to peel them off with a knife, but we got there. <laughs> oh, just, yeah. Oh, I don't know why. I, I must be like, maybe, oh, I don't know, but, yeah. <sighs> I've tried to be as Canadian as possible, but I don't really know how to, so I wore this, like, lumberjacky style, got a, I don't know, a toque, I guess it would be called, and uh, maple syrup. Mmm. <laughs> Okay, jokes aside, I had an absolute blast making the Snowbirds into display aircraft. It's such a wonderful jet. Again, it's another aircraft where I had a massive role to play in why I hadn't built one before. These kits are again quite rare. At the moment, they seem to be going between £30 to £60 and higher if you're getting it abroad. So, so yeah, it's definitely a harder kit to get. But don't let that stop you. All of these aircraft are so wonderful and unique. The only way that someone's going to make another one if they see there's a demand for it. If no one's building them, no one's going to really care about making another one. I would like to make some in its international markings or maybe even in some what if projects, that would be really cool. And hey, I guess I'll still wish that I'll see them live one day, but that's never going to happen. <laughs> so without further ado, I present to you the Canadian Snowbirds display team. <laughs> That's it for today. What did you think? I really, really enjoyed making this. This was probably one of my favourite aircraft that I've ever made. It was very simple, but I think I got a really good result from it. Despite the fact that the decals had some issues, they weren't really, really bad and, you know, just meant I had to be a bit you know, crafty, <laughs> literally and figuratively, about how I put it together. Thank you so much for watching as usual. Please hit the subscribe button, it really does help me out. Also, if you want to watch me build these model kits live, watch out for notifications. It'll come up in your subscription feed at some point, generally between Thursday and Saturday, to let you know what I'm going to be building on that stream. Obviously, it'll, at some point, it'll be in a video. <laughs> it's really nice to build with you guys, and yeah, I can't wait to see y'all soon. Bye! So I also wanted to spend this video to introduce you to the newest member of uh, the modelling family, which, let me pick him up very carefully. It's my little kitten here. So welcome to my family, Archimedes, or Archie. He's called Archie, we really call him. He's um, my lovely little kitten, born on September 30th. As of recording, it's about six weeks. I wanted to remember how big he is, <laughs> so I thought I would uh, put him in one of my little videos and just remember him. He's <laughs> adorable. Um, as someone who never be able to have kids, this is pretty much my child at this point. <laughs> I am turning into one of those people, so modelling and my kitten. <laughs> I turned down all my lights to make sure it's not too bright for him as well. Look how adorable he is! So I've never had a kitten this young before, um, so I've done everything I can. I've read everything I can, I've researched everything I can, and just tried to make sure that I can be as good as owner as I can be. You may notice a lot of scratches over me. <laughs> He does scratch, but he's getting there. Yeah, he seems happy. 
I just hope he is. Gonna have his first vert probably in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, just thought I'd tag this on the end of the video, so I have this permanently forever. And um oh he's looking at me. That's that is weird. Okay, he's done. No, no, he's still looking at me. I wanna be able to look back in like 20 years time when he's either like getting really old or whatever and just remember how it was. I think it's always important to document as much of your life as you can so you can always remember everything. He does seem to like this shelf too much though so I've had to move like all my models from the bottom shelf because I had like my SM79 and stuff so like that's the, this, the like bottom shelf you can see now is empty and then the one above it is a mess because I've had to move everything there. I think he wants to go, I'm, I'm not really sure. No, he's looking, he is just, ooh, licking my dress. Of course he is. Alright, we're, I think, <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Okay. I think we're gonna say goodbye. Ooh, there he is. I'm gonna say goodbye. I'm gonna say goodbye. Uh, yeah, he, yeah, see, I told you. He's saying goodbye. But... I think this is the first time I've ever recorded the end of the video before I've like actually made the model hit. So I genuinely at this point don't know how it turned out, but I, I know this bit was just popped at the end of the video and was sold before any of it started. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you see you next time. Merry, Merry Christmas indeed.